Bonjour, Ozao Makwas and the Bonnet Dishna Kaz Makone Dodem, Trot doing Dunji. Miguch Mishomis, Kibwa say a Jay in Nokum, Miguch the Kid Nokum Kishikak, Wherein a cheek, Wab Mak Nuichi Pomadas, Miguch Kimijiang Mijim, Kimijiang Yabish, Kimijiang Miss Sewin. Mashko Devik, Bagdana Wabanang Madok, Jaonang Madok, Nakapi Hanang Madok, Kiwegnang Madok, Jimishko Gabuyan Zongi de Ion. So, Ojo, my name uh, is Brown Bear Standing. And so, in the Shnabe Moin, it talks about the being that, stand, that you stand behind or represents you. So, for all of you just meeting me, what do you think about a bear standing is what you can expect from me. I, I hope that you're all comfortable with bears. That's good. I'm also of the bear clan. So, I wanted to start this off with Nishnabe Moen. I'm not a uh, a person that was born with lang Nishnabe language, but it's a lifelong learning and passion for me as part of a way of our community and our family to reinvigorate our Nishnabe uh, Bimatsu. I've been asked to start us off today, and so I could take all day explaining what I said in Nishnabe, but short version, we're giving thanks to the food, the waters, the air, giving thanks to the cardinal points of our four directions and asking that we collectively stand strong and have a strong heart. Started off by acknowledging our ancestor spirits uh, that bring us here today. So in English, as has become the fashion, uh, we hear of these land acknowledgements. And so I also will offer you that in English. And what I will say is to give thanks for my ancestors, the ones that have started off here, that moved on to Manitoulin Island, that traveled the great waters of this territory, uh, for all the many generations that have been connected here, and for those that in more contemporary times chose this place to live. Those ones that have passed on, that have become the earth that helps to nourish the food, the animals, that has become part of the air. And when we talk about that acknowledgement of land, we're very much talking about the ancestors that have gone before us, physically becoming the lands that we are in. So now in this territory where many nations have come, we can talk and acknowledge. And if you are in a position like me to start off an event like this, I would encourage you to speak of your personal story of acknowledging the lands. And so for me, that's three generations now that have chosen to live in this space that is called Toronto. In terms of those ancestors that have come before, we acknowledge the Huron, the Peyton, the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and Anishinaabe, Mississauga, peoples, and nations without number whose names we no longer remember because of our experience of colonialism. So I wanted to share that with you today. And as we move forward, I would hope that every time that people get together, we acknowledge those beings that have come before us, and those are our ancestors. Ho miigwech. <coughs> Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Michael White, for starting us off in a good way this evening, and last week for leading us in an Anishinaabe small ceremony on the land to feast this new resource and set our intentions for what we hope this book and tonight's gathering can contribute to. We are happy to introduce you to the Dr. Eric Jackman Institute of Child Study and the work of its laboratory school. My name is Richard Messina. I'm the principal of Jackman ICS Laboratory School, and it is my honor to say again, welcome. We are delighted you can join us this evening to celebrate the launch of Natural Curiosity, second edition, a resource for educators that is responding to the burning need to bring indigenous perspectives in children's environmental inquiry. With us today are colleagues and guests from the wide world of education. Tonight, we have friends from Indigenous communities and organizations, the Ministry of Education, researchers, faculties of education at universities across Ontario, guests from environmental organizations, and from school classrooms across Greater Toronto area and well beyond it. We have many parents here tonight and children, parents who are the primary and most important teachers of all. We welcome all of you. At the Dr. Eric Jackman Institute of Child Study, environmental inquiry builds on a 93-year history of research and practice. Like other university-affiliated schools, the Jackman ICS Lab School has as its mission exploring optimal environments for learning, influencing public policy and practice, 
demonstrating the power of children's thinking and honoring children's natural curiosity. As part of the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, our institute is dedicated to improving the lives of children through its two-year MA teacher education program in child study and education, through the Dr. RGN Laidlaw Center for Multidisciplinary Research in Child Development, and through its elementary school, the Lab School, which serves children from nursery through to grade six in inquiry-based classrooms that receive hundreds of visitors from around the world annually. Thanks to the ongoing generous support of our donors, we have been able to support an initiative in inquiry-based learning which addresses one of the world's most pressing issues, the vulnerable state of our natural world. Imagine having the opportunity to document and record the nurturing of children's innate curiosity about the planet Earth. What we came to call the Jackman Institute of Child Study Environmental Education Initiative, a very long name, allowed us to question our own practice, to look closely at the things we were doing with measurable success, and the things we knew we could understand better from the vast wealth of knowledge held by members of Indigenous communities. From the beginning of creating this resource, we were very lucky. I think some of our team would join me in saying that it was fortunate we were so innocent as we started. We didn't realize until we were well into the second edition just how huge the work we had taken would be for our little school. We were absolutely blessed to have three outstanding writers, Doug Anderson, Julie Comey, and Lorraine Cerotto under the masterful direction of Haley Higdon, program lead. Our partnership with the Robertson Program of Inquiry-Based Teaching in Mathematics and Science connected us with many Indigenous communities in Ontario. We are grateful to our supporters at the Ministry of Education and to the French Ministry for currently translating this document. And we give special thanks to our colleagues in teacher education at OISE. And here we are today, in the beautiful J. Fraser Mustard Assembly Hall, a new community gathering space named by an anonymous donor after the world-renowned Torontonian Fraser Mustard, who led a relentless crusade to better the lives of children, drawing attention to the crucial first years of life. Our donor understood our history and role in exerting a profound influence on both early education and the importance of interdepartmental and interdisciplinary relationships. Beginning with our event this evening, the Fraser Mustard Assembly Hall will support Natural Curiosity's efforts to lead the way in disseminating research on how children learn and what they need to flourish. The resource, Natural Curiosity 2, offers educators a powerful way to engage students in learning about their world. It provides a framework for environmental inquiry shaped by students' questions and theories, their natural curiosity as they explore their environment. This book encourages educators to find their own ways to build upon children's sense of wonder and to create a culture of community of community learning that is purposeful, responsive, and deeply engaging. This book supports a stronger awareness of Indigenous approaches to environmental learning. It supports, it offers an encounter with Indigenous perspectives that challenge us to think in very different ways about our place in the world. The Indigenous lens provides a starting point in a conversation that opens educators' eyes to Indigenous perspectives as their students build lasting connections with the natural world. It is my pleasure now to introduce Chris Bogert, Vice Principal of the Lab School and Chair of the Jackman ICS Environmental Initiative Team. Thank you, Richard. 
The making of a book is truly a remarkable and an agonizing experience. <laughs> this second edition of Natural Curiosity would not have happened without the vision, the determination, and the tender loving care of some very special people. We want to thank Doug Anderson for his powerful, thought-provoking writing of the Indigenous Lens, which unfolded over about two years of heartfelt discussion and reflection. It was not an easy process, but we are so grateful that he persevered. His writing is an immense gift to us all. We thank Julie Comey, who so beautifully revised our first edition, enriching it with new critical writing after extensive research, reading, and careful interviewing of lab school teachers to express our pedagogy as we currently understand it. Thank you, Julie. Thank you to Lorraine Chiarato, who created the visionary first edition of this resource, upon which this revised edition is built. Thank you, Lorraine. <laughs> Deep appreciation is extended to our environmental education team, including our past and present Natural Curiosity Project leads, Lorraine Chiarato, Andrea Russell, and Haley Higdon, as well as Principal Richard Messina and former Principal <laughs> Elizabeth Morty. Andrea grew Natural Curiosity into a transformative professional learning program and lay the groundwork for, to make this edition possible. Haley Higdon is our current Natural Curiosity project lead, and her passionate commitment to environmental sustainability and nature-based learning has been an inspiration as she masterminded the creation and production of this resource. Next, Haley will share a bit more about this journey and the people we need to acknowledge tonight for their contributions. But before she does this, I want to say a few more words about Haley. The publishing of a book usually involves many people, each fulfilling different roles from agent, writing coach, proofreader, through to marketing director. Well, Haley accomplished, supported, or supervised all of these jobs and more herself, and very much deserves the title of managing editor for this resource. Haley also deserves recognition for the thoughtful and professional way she approached this responsibility. She took the time that was needed to make connections with people, to build meaningful relationships, and to support and encourage all of the educators, the contributors, and the advisors. She did this despite pressures to just get it done, not forsaking the necessity of taking this extra time. She knew, and sometimes had to remind us, that this was a process that could not be rushed. In fact, in doing this, she stayed true to the values of what this book is all about. And we are so grateful that she did, because we are going to need these partnerships and the collaboration that she has started as we move forward with taking up the call to action in this document. That, plus her dogged determination to have everyone around her pay attention to their environmental impact and make wiser, more sustainable choices, makes her quite a force to be reckoned with in her own charming and humble way. <laughs> we also thank Haley for this fabulous event which she's organized with our Natural Curiosity team. I'd like to invite Haley Higdon to come up now and speak to us. Wow, okay. thank you, Chris. That really means a lot. Whew. <laughs> Okay, so thank you to Michael and to Richard and to Chris and to all the guests that are here tonight. I'm truly honored and humbled to be standing here among you and all of the exceptional educators in this space tonight. Many of you in the room were some of the first supporters of the first edition of Natural Curiosity when it was launched in 2011. When the resource was created, the lab school had no idea how it would take off and how much support it would receive from people like you. So thank you for being there then and for being here tonight. So in the story of the creation of the second edition of Natural Curiosity, I need to start by thanking the elders and educators from Johnny Terrio School. In 2014, members of the laboratory school um, and the uh, Environmental Education Initiative team um, realized through conversation with educators from this school on Arrowland First Nation how much there was still to learn about situating Indigenous perspectives into Canadian curriculum. 
It was this conversation that started us on this journey and motivated us to support and to find support for this second edition. We are so grateful to have found donors to support the project. Our sincerest thanks to TD Friends of the Environment, the Norman and Marion Robertson Foundation, and private donors. Without you, it would not have been possible to create this resource. The next step was for Natural Curiosity um, to invite people to join an advisory board to help guide the direction of the resource. Many thanks are in order for their diverse advice, consult consultation, review, and helpful contributions to various aspects of the Indigenous lens on this edition. Momentum gathered as points of convergence and discontinuities between Natural Curiosity's approach and certain Indigenous perspectives were identified. Doug Anderson, who has thought long and deeply about such matters, agreed to articulate these perspectives in this edition. Other experts offered their insights and a project was launched. Looking back at the first edition, lab school educators realized that it was not enough to simply layer an Indigenous perspective on our own fixed way of doing things. We began to see our values and practices through other eyes. And this triggered a process of rethinking and refining what was most important to our philosophy and practice. We had never meant to freeze our approach. Our beliefs and practices remain living, breathing, dynamic processes that are inevitably and repeatedly revised as our school, like all schools, builds relationships with changing communities and changing in changing times. So next, we went looking for educators, and luckily we found 15 teachers who were willing to engage in a conversation about sharing their practice. I want to thank all the educators who courageously and openly shared their stories of environmental inquiry, allowing us to learn and benefit from their experiences. In the first edition, all of the stories were written by Lorraine Chiarato after interviewing and spending time with the teachers. In the second edition, the stories have been written by the teachers themselves, and this was intentional, as we wanted to truly honor the different voices of all of those involved. The educators wrote from schools in rural North Northwest Ontario, in downtown Toronto, in Caledon, in Kingston, and Ottawa. They teach in alternative schools, at inner city public schools, a First Nation school, and our university lab school. Taken together, the educators' stories powerfully illustrate some of the unique ways that environmental inquiry can come to life in classrooms. As we think about strengthening environmental inquiry with Indigenous perspectives, these stories from teachers reflect the beginning of a journey rather than a destination. It is hoped that they will motivate meaningful dialogue about the links between environmental education and Indigenous thinking as we move forward on this path together. While only a few of the educators explicitly address Indigenous perspectives or content, aspects of the perspectives highlighted in the Indigenous lens surface throughout all of the stories. As teachers everywhere begin to build Indigenous content and perspectives into learning experiences for their students, an emerging challenge for, um, challenging area for many, stories such as these provide a starting point for a continuing conversation. So I want to thank Steph, Beverly, Marge, Sarah, Glenda, Gail, and Hopi, Carol, Zoe, Ellie, Velvet, Lisa, Cindy, Marlo, Robin, Mike, Murray, and Janice. So originally, their names have been up here, but I really wanted to say their names out loud and acknowledge them for um, having the courage to open up their practice and share what they're doing. Um, I would also like to thank Richard Reeve for his contribution to this edition titled Knowledge Forum, In the Ground Beneath the Trees. So once these stories and um, the lenses and um, all of the branches were collected, uh, we were so we so appreciated having the support of some incredibly skilled editors to bring the resource together. So I want to thank Tracy, Christine, Julie, Glenn, and Chris for the time that they thoughtfully spent with the resource.
thank you to Casey and Ron for helping us to navigate the world of book distributors. I no longer have to put a box of book on, books on my bicycle and deliver them. We actually have a div distributor who is helping us with this. And so I want to, help, uh, to thank Cindy at the University of Toronto Press for her support with this process. I also want to thank Zach for his wonderful, photo, wonderful photos in the book and for Dino and Doug um, for their design expertise. And a very, a very special thank you to Invert Media for their consultation and beautiful Indigenous graphics, which you can also see here. Many thanks to past project coordinators. Uh, Amanda, Becky, Camila, Nikki, and work study students, Anna and Mariah, and to our newest program coordinator, Rosa, and to all the volunteers from today. This would not have been possible without all of your help. Finally, we owe our deepest thanks to all of the children in the classrooms represented in this resource for joining us on this journey. Without the children's willingness to follow their curiosity, try things out, and wholeheartedly embrace their teachers' experimentations with environmental inquiry, there would be no resource. I would now like to introduce Doug Anderson, the author of The Indigenous Lens in the second edition of Natural Curiosity. Thank you. Bonjour. Bien again. Adik no dem za ona kod dižnikas. Ano da benjeba. Panji me ti ando. I am speaking as best I can, introducing myself as best I can in uh, Anishinaabemwin. My family is uh, Scottish Métis from Manitoba, but uh, landed here. A lot of my uncles and aunts landed in southern Ontario uh, in the 50s and 60s. Um, when I was invited, encouraged, um, pushed by my, my wife <laughs> to uh, take on some writing with this uh, second edition, um, I, my initial feeling was I, I don't think I could be doing this. Uh, not, not because uh, I didn't think I could do it so much as you, I thought maybe I'll do it wrong and I might get in trouble. And, <laughs> It sounds funny and it's kind of a joke, but in a way it's not because um, it hasn't been too long since, uh, there's nothing in this edition that's shared that is uh, knowledge that should not be shared. Um, it's, it should be, I think, general, a lot of it should be general knowledge. It's a basic introduction to uh, what it might mean to develop an ongoing relationship um, with indigenous perspectives and how we all learn. But um, many people uh, have been thrown in jail uh, and, and gotten into trouble, indigenous people, for uh, trying to continue to practice these things up until fairly recently in Canadian history. And it, it's always uh, a difficult uh, and challenging and sometimes uncomfortable thing to, to try and represent those perspectives in, in a written format. So I did struggle with the question, you know, is this something I should try and do? Um, what I guess uh, it, what sort of tipped it was um, a sense that um, we don't have much time left. And uh, I, I do feel strongly that uh, what we have to do for our children, how we need to help them uh, come to grips with what's coming, um, it, we, it can't wait. And uh, I think, I, I know in my heart, m many indigenous people everywhere uh, have been waiting to be heard. And so what this, I would say, what this document <clears throat> does, or this lens does more than anything, is really um, invite educators to consider uh, how, to, how to proceed towards a more ethical and meaningful relationship with those perspectives. And over time, um, to bring them to life with Indigenous peoples. Um, how that's done is not is not something we can prescribe. Uh, it's something that has to come from those communities in partnership. So I felt that it was important uh, going into this thing um, to really 
struggle with those questions. And I think that's why <laughs> they, they waited longer than they, uh, one reason why they waited longer than <laughs> they had anticipated. Uh, the other one being, of course, the, the wonderful additions that were made by, by, by educators who were uh, unfortunately reading half-drafted uh, versions of what I had been putting together while they were in the classroom uh, exploring related ideas. It's, uh, it's all very exciting. I feel very excited and good about it. Um, I think it's important to uh, just acknowledge a few people. I was asked to mention some of the people who helped bring that Indigenous perspective, and it's not everybody. It's really important to understand that um, I, didn't, I didn't write this so much as simply reflect uh, a lot of things that uh, people uh, have been sharing um, here and in other places, Indigenous people, for, for some time. Uh, but uh, in particular, uh, Glenn Aikenhead, uh, who is a, a non-Indigenous person, but who spent a lot of time working with uh, Nahiwak people in, and other people in Saskatchewan, uh, exploring their, how their perspectives can, can tie into the uh, learning processes, especially in relation to scientific inquiry, uh, was very helpful. And he, he poured a lot of energy into this. Um, uh, a lot of energy. <laughs> he sent probably the equivalent of a book to me while this was being formulated. Um, and I, I felt kind of guilty because I didn't, I don't think I was able to even read it all. But I really am grateful. Um, Vern Douglas Bidavan uh, is uh, a, a mentor of mine who I've known for uh, at least a quarter of a century. And he's uh, a retired teacher, principal, uh, cultural advisor at Trent uh, Indigenous Studies Program and, and more. Uh, and he, he really um, is, was able to, to look at this and, and actually uh, play devil's advocate. I think that's one thing I value most about Vernon. He's a dear friend and he, he really helped uh, keep it simple. It, it may not, it's, it's still a little too dense in my, in my view looking back, but he really helped to sort of hone some of what we were trying to trying to really get across. Uh, Christine Lusa is a, a young scholar, um, and if Vern is, is, uh, is kind of this solid, kind of conservative in a, in a good way voice, Christine was the one who was kind of like my screaming conscience, and she really did, uh, she really did add a lot of perspective to this that was more youthful. She's a young uh, scholar, from, uh, also from the same program in Peterborough, the Indigenous Studies. Um, as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, who was the fourth that we have that I've forgotten? <laughs> um, it's up here. I didn't write it down. Um, it'll come to me. I, I before we, oh, Jennifer Wemming wants. I'm not. I'm not going to explain who that is. But Jennifer uh, did. Uh, it's my wife. <laughs> she's known for she's known for being able to reflect a lot of things visually, among other things. She's teaching tonight and couldn't be here. Um, my son's here in her stead. Um, Jennifer did uh, with someone else that I'd like to 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 introduce you to um, come up with the design uh, images and concepts, uh, and I'd like to in also acknowledge. Uh, our good friend, Michelle, who's sitting in the audience, who is an, a native person who prefers to quietly work in the background, but Jennifer and, uh, and Michelle have worked, have worked very closely on a lot of things, and she's also a dear friend who uh, is also an aunt to our son, and uh, a very, very gifted graphic artist and photographer, and uh, so we're really grateful to you, Michelle. Um, beautiful work. You can stand up if you want, but I know you're shy. Uh, she, she's an unsung hero. Uh, heroine. Uh, the, I guess uh, I want to hustle along. I'm known for rambling. Uh, the, the, the last thing I want to acknowledge, though, are the, the many, many other people um, that, that have been coming and going. The very first person who's quoted uh, in, in, the, in the preface, uh, Sam Conroy, and many other people who uh, informed this. Um, and I, I'm really look, you know, looking forward to seeing how their spirits are, are taken up in different ways. So, thank you much.
So yesterday I had the honor of joining a, jum, a drum circle with the Spirit Wind Women's Hand Drum Group. And I am excited to welcome them here tonight to share their voices and the songs of their drums. I want to thank them for joining us tonight, but I also want to thank them for providing me with a space to forget about the stress of planning all of this mm -hmm. and just um, live in the beat of our drums and the sound of our collective voices. So thank you for that last night. The drum has been acknowledged as the heartbeat of Mother Air Earth since time immemorial. And I want to welcome that heartbeat to our celebration tonight. <laughs> Just like to give thanks um, for being able to be here. Um, my little free spirit is over there and <laughs> she almost ran off, so we're all good. Um, we thank you all. I, we had an opportunity on the way up here. We spent a lot of time down the road, the Native Center, so grabbed a couple of sisters on our way up. So <laughs> I told them we're going to be here for a couple of minutes and I want to share with you, share a couple of songs with you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for the beautiful book and all your work. Thank you. 
I'd love to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Niguan, Niguan Wewi, James Sinclair. He's uh, Anishinaabe from St. Peter's, Little Pegasus, and an associate professor at University of Manitoba. He's an award-winning writer, editor, and activist who was named one of Monocle Magazine's uh, Canada's Top 20 Most Influential People and one of the CBC Manitoba's Top 40 Under 40. He is a regular commentator on Indigenous issues on CTV, CBC, and ABTN. And his written work can be found in the pages of newspapers like Globe and Mail and online with CBC Books, Canada Writes. His first book on Anishinaabek literary traditions will be coming out with the University of uh, Minnesota Press in 2018. So um, welcome, Nigan. Told my brother Michael over there make this true Anishinaabe style. We'll be here till the morning. So it's been the longest book launch ever. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know what you guys in uh, Toronto do, but uh, I never have keynotes at book launches, so I don't know what I'm doing here really. But much for that. And uh, I'm not under 40 anymore, but I'm going to hold on to that to my dying breath. I 42. <laughs> But my partner's like, uh, why did you take that out of your bio? I'm like, never. It's staying in there till I'm 80. I'm going to die. He was the top of the other 40. That's right. Anyways. So, miigwech. Bonjour, dene magana duk. Nigan wewedam nishita kas namago shin. Ni men wendam omayayan. Gana bach bangi gissin agwajing. And it's a beautiful day out there. And uh, I want to say miigwech for the zukupun that's coming, the snow that's coming. It's true Manitoba day. Coming, so miigwech for bringing that in. Miigwech is same up, bonjour, Anishinaabek, Jaganashak, Wemetagojoak. I want to thank my brother for uh, welcoming all of our non human relatives and inviting them into this space. Uh, I want to say miigwech to my uh, uh, nieces and my sisters for that beautiful song, uh, uh, the two beautiful songs that you had. Uh, I'm going to do my best to try to talk a little bit and not talk too long because I'm a Sinclair. We can just keep going. Really, I just forget. We just keep going. And so uh, I'm going to talk about a couple things, but I just want to uh, say it is a complete honor to be here. It's a complete honor to share with you the celebration of a beautiful uh, Maznabiyage, a Maznabiyage, which is for us, it is beautiful writing. So it's uh, Maznabiyage is also the word that we use to describe art or a graphic novel. But uh, in this case, uh, this beautiful Mazda Biege that's being produced in front of us is a beautiful gift for all of us. Uh, when I greeted you at the beginning, I said, hello, my relatives, bojo indinoe magaraduk. I did not say nuitja waganuk, which would be my friends. I said bojo indinoe magaraduk, those who sound like me, my relatives. And the reason why I did that is because we are not friends, we are family. Uh, we are connected through familial relations now going on hundreds and hundreds of years. And before that, thousands of years. Going all the way back to our first creation story as Anishinaabek upon being placed on the earth and being accepted by those in creation who had to accept us. And there was a big meeting held where the creator said, just like this. There, there was the sun and the moon over there, and there was the winds and the directions, and then there was all of the animal beings. And the creator said, okay, everybody, listen up. We're going to bring humans. And the crowd went, ooh. <laughs> Things are going so well along here. <laughs> Who is going to take care of them? Who is going to invite them into their homes? Who is going to adopt them as family? Who is going to guide them mentor them and help them to succeed because as when a family comes over we don't make them sleep in the garage we take care of them uh, we give them good food to eat we give them good spaces safe spaces to live we teach them where the medicines are and it was those animal relations those dodamak uh, which took us in and adopted us as family not friends which gave us a gift and a modeling in which we handed to other beings that came to this territory, which is why we use our Dodamak on treaties, was why we offered those treaties to other newcomers, and we still continue to do that today. When the Syrians show up in Winnipeg and they are coming to our community, we greet them at the airport with a song, not to scare them, but to say, you are home now, you are family now. Bonjour and so that is what a model that I want to be able to express for tonight. But uh, when you come to a, a family, 
you bring a gift, just like you do with your auntie or with your uncle or with your grandmother or your grandfather, your mushum or your kukum, you bring a gift. And so I want to acknowledge this beautiful sema, which was offered to me this evening. The word of sema comes from a shema, which means instant. And when tobacco is offered, and I'm not talking about Benson and Hedges here, I'm not talking about carcinogenic stuff, which I always have to tell to young people, don't smoke. I mean, we weren't intended to smoke 50 cigarettes a day, 50, you know, you do anything, you drink 50 liters of water, you're going to get very sick and you're going to die. Uh, tobacco was intended for us to do once in a while, something when, when the, the occasion called for it, when we smoked it in a pipe and we brought that pipe together and we connected creation. A sema, when a sema is offered and when it is accepted, when it is offered as a baggage nun, which is an offering and is accepted, that baggage nun becomes a contract, it becomes a responsibility, it becomes that gift of connection. And that connection doesn't just happen between a Doug and myself. It comes from all of my family and all of my familiar relations with Doug's family and familiar relations, which is why I greeted you as Bojo and Dinway Magana Duk, by accepting that Asema. So I want to acknowledge that beautiful Asema. There are so many teachings that I want to share with you tonight about the earth because this book uh, is a remarkable achievement in honoring our traditions, in honoring who we are as Anishinaabe people, as indigenous peoples on this territory. There are uh, many, many different parts when we talk about education of what does that mean uh, to be a teacher. Now, I have to put all my cards on the table here. I am a recovering teacher. <laughs> I'm on step seven of the process. I'm in, I'm beyond denial. I'm now into recognition. And, uh, you know, this, you know, being a teacher, I write many curriculums. Today I was with 200 teachers off in Durham, working with teachers on. What I always say, and when I always begin, it begins with the land. Uh, if you were to understand indigeneity, any indigenous nation, or what we might refer to as indigenous pedagogy or indigenous education, it begins with the land. Everything I spoke about from the Asema to relatives, to uh, connection, to relationships, to treaties, everything has to do with land. And so when we talk about land as indigenous peoples, we are not talking about environmentalists or environmentalism. We are talking about lifeism. You know, uh, you know, people are often saying indigenous peoples are environmental activists. We're not environmentalists. We are lifeists. We believe in life. We're not anti-energy. We're not anti-economy. We're anti-death. And that's why, for us, it's not a question of protecting our relatives who accepted us at the first moment of creation, those dodamak, which represented the earth and the sun and the sky and all of those things. It is because we stand up for our relatives when someone puts them under assault. When they are under assault, like you would with your auntie or your cousin or your niece or your son or your daughter, you stand up for them. You stand up for them because they are family, not friends. And on the prairies right now, but I would say in the larger sphere of the past 150 years, there has been perhaps no bigger assault on the land than there has been in our recent economic agenda. We are now using fossil fuels, land, resources at an exponential rate. And at the same time, over 150 years, in almost the exact same pattern, there has been a universal assault on indigenous bodies, and particularly those of women, girls, and children. And this 150 years of the assault of the land and the assaults on indigenous bodies have been happening at the exact same time. And all you have to do is look at the oil sands of Alberta, all of the use of Canada's resource agenda, and at the same uncoincidental time, the murders of Colton Bushy and Tina Fontaine. All of it is one big moment of injustice that is exponentially increasing. And if I can give you a pop quiz in a teacher-like way for just a moment, how many of Canada's future resource projects, that means a mine, uh, that means a dam, that means a highway, that means a transmission line, that means an oil pipeline, are on lands occupied by, adjacent to, or claimed by indigenous peoples in Canada? And this is a trick question. How many? 
100%. And Canada yet continues to try to, conti to uh, as if it was 1961 and we couldn't hire lawyers and we weren't allowed to leave the reserve and mm -hmm. the old Indian Act was still into place. We still have the Indian Act. It's really not, that, not all that changed. Uh, Canada proceeds as if the old Indian Act is still in place when we couldn't resist and we had legal things in place what we couldn't resist. But now we can resist. And now we stand up for our relatives. And this kind of work, there's perhaps no more important conversation than it is about indigenous perspectives of the, the world around us, our, our environment, but most importantly, our relatives. Our relatives are Dodamak, our water and our land and our relationships with all of those things. And I want to just give you a little brief idea over how revolutionary this book is. Having flipped through and getting the advanced copy that you gave me, I don't know how long ago was that? November. Back in November? I got the secret copy before everybody. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know why. They just, you came up to me at the gathering and sort of said, hey, you know, what do you think of the book? Let me know what your thoughts. And I was very happy to get it and flip through it back on the plane. The kind of work that's revolutionary is that for many, many years, the assault on indigenous bodies and the assaults of the land have continued abated. They've continued uh, in an ongoing manner to the point where if you see indigenous knowledge historically, uh, such as the question of why is the rabbit white, which by the way is a lesson in this book. Uh, <clears throat> We used to exist in children's literature section, or fantasy, or fiction, and now we exist in classrooms. That kind of revolutionary change can truly change the past 150 years and the path forward. Call to action 6 through 12 in the TRC calls to action, and I happen to uh, have a bit of experience with the TRC call. My dad was the head of it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, call to action 6 through 12 directly asks, asks teachers to repudiate the most devastating, violent cause of the past 150 years in terms of the treatment of land and water, which is the principle of terra nullius. Terra nullius, of course, is the idea that the land is empty. Uh, not only are indigenous peoples ignored in that equation, but most markedly so are our non-human relatives who are thought to have no agency, no perspective, and certainly no government or laws or, or ideas. By the way, uh, do animals write? Do they express themselves? I noticed that you had Dr. Jan Hare on here, whose work on uh, indigenous literacy is brilliant. So check it out if you ever get a chance. Uh, do indigenous peoples write? Well, my brother, we all know that bears mark trees, right? Why do bears mark the tree? It's two reasons. Why do they scratch the tree? Well, one is to say, uh, I'm here. Uh, this is territory, not because it's ownership. I don't see bears putting up a fence. I see bears marking a tree and saying, I'm here. If you're gonna come in here, you're probably gonna run into me and then we're gonna have to figure each other out. What's the second reason bears mark a tree? They leave their scent and they leave their markings to indicate their size and if they're interested in a mate. And what they're really saying is, if you're gonna come in this territory, you better be ready for this. <laughs> uh, markings on trees are the literate example of an animal world that is not only talking about relationship, but is sending out a love letter. Do animals write? Absolutely. Do animals have literacy? Absolutely. And this kind of work, by repudiating the notions that the world is an animate place full of agency and expression, is so badly needed in this time. I want to give you all one gift as we go, to sort of engage on how might you engage, engage young people in the notion of terra nullius. How might you undermine that? Because you're not going to take kindergarten students and say, okay, let's start it repudiating legal, legal concepts that started the 16th century. <laughs> but here's what you can do. And it's a little easier, easier with kindergartens than you can with grade 12s. Grade 12s want to write an essay about it, right? or they don't really want to write the essay, but you know what I mean. Here's what you do. You do exactly what's in this book. On every page, on every moment, it says, go outside. And here's what you do. You take your young people, and you say to each one of them, I want you to say hello to everything that's alive. And kids love this. Kindergartens love it. 
Hello, Mr. Wilson. Hello, Fido the dog. Uh, hello, sun. Hello, moon. Hello, sky. Hello, water. Hello, grass. And what you do is you come back to the classroom and you say, all of those things that you saw, how did you know they're alive? And you'll have many different ideas. They grew, they had a heartbeat, they had agency, they, they had some sort of say or they expressed something. And you say, well, what about a grass? You know, grass doesn't have a heartbeat, but it seems to grow. And then you come up with a determination and you say, does, is the earth speaking? Does it have expression? You might bring up bears, for example. And then what you say to young people is you say, um, who has a member of their family that is a non-human being? Anybody? Anybody who has a non-human being here? Yeah? Haley, what do you got? You got a dog? Oh, you got a cat. Uh, anyone got a dog here? <laughs> got a dog? Okay, anyone got a, a hamster? Right? Okay, my point is that, let's just talk about dogs for just a second. I got a dog. And so, a uh, baby's her name. You know, you take baby out and you take her for a walk and you say to her, okay, baby, uh, I want you to follow what I have to say because I own you. And you can pull the ownership papers and show the baby and say, look, I own you, baby. And baby will say, absolutely, I acquiesce to your control and obviously I'll do everything that you say. No, not at all. What will the dog do? Whatever it wants. Why does the dog come back? Why does the dog respect you? Why does the dog honor you? Why does the dog give you love? Because you, you have a relationship with it. Animals understand relationship. They understand that when you offer a gift, it might be food, that they will also offer a gift. And that is just like the practice that we started with this evening. That, that notion of relationship is, is a universal language that we engage with with our animal relations all the time. Now, I don't use cats, Haley, because cats are plotting our death all the time. But, but, but that's true. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, it, she, the cat's at home setting traps for you right now. But it, um, my point is, is that what you do with your young people is you say, uh, the world is an animate place, a place of life and a place of agency. It's just that we, at times, are too illiterate to be able to read it. We are too uh, um, misunderstanding to be able to understand the language of the earth itself. And for our indigenous people, and Anishinaabe people particularly, this song that you witnessed was the evidence of a relationship mechanism that we have been doing for thousands and thousands of years, deeply tied to the earth, involving the sense of echo and relationship that comes with the responsibility of breath. These beautiful voices that you heard were a model in which indigenous education was about looking to the earth, understanding what we saw, and then doing our best to try to express ourselves in relation to it. And whether it be tobacco, whether it be the creation story, or whether it be a song, we spent thousands of years creating intellectual systems based on a relationship with the world around us. The most important teachers were those original Dodamak, from the very first creation story that accepted us as family and brought us into creation. And we still, today, look at those Dodamak. Uh, when I was up in Durham today, uh, I went and watched the rainbow trout who are now spawning and jumping into going upstream right now. Uh, nothing should represent colonialism, the resistance against colonialism more than watching our rainbow trout relatives go try to go upstream in the most resilient and powerful of ways. These lessons are as valuable today as they ever were, or as an elder once said to me, uh, the internet has always been here. We just called it the rivers. And that teaching is what I want to leave you with this evening, that this may look like a book, this may look like lesson plans, this may look like first-hand accounts, but it is the same story that has been told for thousands of years in indigenous intellectual systems that talk about why is the rabbit white? And those principles are everlasting, continue, and as, are as innovative and technologically capable and grow innovative as they ever, ever have been. And I want to say a huge miigwech for inviting me to this beautiful book and being a part of such a wonderful, incredible achievement of bringing our knowledge into the classrooms. For those of us who are recovering educators, 
Uh, those of us who are current educators, I wish this was around when I was around as a teacher and maybe I would still be a teacher. Maybe I would do the brave uh, work that teachers do on a daily basis by turning to their young people and saying, Nimen Wendam O Mayayan, Boju and Dinoe Magaraduk, hello my relatives, and I'm so happy that we are here together. That is the power of a teacher, is seizing the moment and creating something beautiful in that time. You may not see the wave, but you'll always see the splash. So miigwech my relatives, and thank you very much for having me at this wonderful night. Thank you so much, Nigam, for coming to our launch and for these beautiful and compelling words. stirring way that you spoke about our book and about our relationships, um, about our relationships as family with the natural world, with the fauna and the flora and the elements and the way that we have to stand up for our relatives. These words are going to linger in our minds long after tonight. We also thank Michael White and the Spirit Wind Women's Hand Drumming Group for starting us off in a good way. Thank you to everyone for celebrating with us this evening. In a few moments, we will invite you to join us for a reception here in the auditorium and to enjoy the delicious food provided by Nish Dish. We are so... <laughs> we are so proud of what we've accomplished with this resource, but we know that this is just the first leg of an unfinished journey. We have learned so much from Doug, and from many others during the creation of this book. And we are grateful that we'll be continuing to work together as we try to figure out what the implications of this resource are going to be for our community and our classrooms. We invite you all to join us on this journey. I'd like to now share a quote from Doug's preface to remind us as we move forward that Indigenous perspectives cannot be deeply reflected in a written document or outside of their cultural context. All that can be provided here are some indications of how such perspectives can inform environmental inquiry. The living and moving spirits of students, educators, and communities are needed for transforming awareness over time into understanding, knowledge, and eventually wisdom. Doug's words are a gift, but also a responsibility. Now that we have this new understanding, what are we going to do with it? His words challenge us. They also invite, provoke, inspire, implore us to begin, in his words, to consider how an indigenous lens informs learning in ways that address our present and future by improving our relationship with the world around us. It is a humble beginning that holds great promise for all people. Michael will now lead us in a closing. Chi miigwech. It's a tough act to follow. <laughs> so we've done elements of ceremony. There's been a lot of preparation, have you seen, from the pre uh, preparing of this book to a ceremony that we did on the weekend. Uh, we've done a reenactment of creation and bringing the elements together. This part of this is, uh, this is closing of the ceremony, and then we'll finally have a feast. So we had some singing. Part of this, uh, this traditional sharing of singing is to draw spirits and other than humans in. So this song, if you know it, Doug, you're going to sing along with me. Um, when we're singing this song, we're not using a drum or a rattle. We're letting the spirits know that uh, we're thankful for them coming to be with us today. And if they have other responsibilities, just as I'm sure all of you carry other responsibilities, it's okay for them to depart. All right? So Doug, you're going to sing with me? Come on. <laughs> all right, you can, you can sing from there, okay? Hi, hi, namasho. Hi hi namasho namasho hi hi namasho hi hi namasho hey hey hi hi we o hey 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 hi hi we o hey we o hey hi hi we o hey hi hi we o hey 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 oh me gosh